that out. That song keeps rolling quite along. Thank you, Maddie, for doing that today. Welcome to Mindful Mobility. I'm Ken Mays, your host. I'm going to uh, mention that we have a webinar series presented by Green Transportation Summit at Expo, West Coast Collaborative, Mobilize California, Driving Change. We're talking about how do I prepare my service facility for electric vehicles and ADOS or autonomous vehicles. Next slide. We have sponsors, Central Oregon Community College, Diagnostic Network, Chabot College, Clean Cities of Treasure Valley, Idaho. We have Long Beach Clean Cities, Advanced Vehicle Training Group Northwest, Utah Clean Cities, Future Tech, and East Bay Clean Cities Coalition. Next slide. Our famous saying is cars are everywhere. They're one of the biggest, most complicated products that we use every day by Professor Hayward. Let's do a little housekeeping. We're gonna repeat this, but uh, we've got several folks on here. I don't know how many of you are repeats, but if you wanna chat, then go ahead and chat to each other in the chat box. But when you see the question and answer box below, that's where I need your questions. So feel free to lodge your question during any one of the presentations. We have three speakers today and we'll answer these first during the question and answer section, which we'll have three of. The webinar recording will be available to all attendees and please complete the event feedback form when the seminar is finished. Next slide. Today we're gonna to have uh, Richard Battersby. I'll introduce him. I actually get to talk a little bit about what I do. And then we'll have the great Scott Brown who will join us again. Definitions, these are uh, a little bit familiar with some of you, but take a look at ones that you may not know. I'm gonna mention PPE today. One I have never used is NN, Neural Network. Next slide. Little clip on uh, my lab. Oh, so this is Scott, sorry. That is fabulous. Thank you, Scott. That was fabulous. Um, one of the things I'd like to introduce to all of you is this uh, resource library with the AutoCAT Center. It's AutoCAT, that's Center for Advanced Automotive Technology. It's at caat.org. And on the resource page, you'll see the advanced vehicle technician standards being posted. We're up to nine standards already complete out of 18. I'll show you what these are. These are part of a National Science Foundation grant. I happen to be the principal investigator on that, but other people are doing all the work. Next slide. The standards, uh, here, are the, uh, here are the electric vehicle only, even though fuel cell are still electric vehicles. But as you glance through here, these are the categories that'll be used as standards in the future. Next slide. And then we have the fuel cell categories as well, still electric, but we have to add the high pressure component as you would expect with fuel cell. Next slide. I'm gonna give you a polling question. Let's see how we do. What is your organization's greatest challenge in preparing for servicing electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles? And you can choose multiple answers.
The next question is, what steps are you taking to prepare your business or organization? Also multiple answers. And you may want to scroll down to the last question if you don't see it. There are actually seven possible answers there. Multiple choice if you choose. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, what is your organization's greatest challenge in preparing for servicing electric vehicles or autonomous? Education, training, 75%. Funding for equipment, 54%. Return on investment, 29%. State mandates or regulations, which I didn't explain very well, but some of you got that okay. Next question, what steps are you taking to prepare your business for or organization? Classes at local community technical college. Classes on manufacturers, that was 32%. Classes on manufacturer specific, 46%. Intensive on-site training, example, one week training at a specific location, 25%. Online training, 71%. Exploring the overall benefits to my organization, 18%. None at the moment, 4%. Can I wait for another 10 years to see what goes on? 4%. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. It is my privilege to introduce uh, Richard Battersby, the director of East Bay Clean Cities Coalition. He is uh, part of lots of webinars, especially in the California area. Richard is an assistant director of public works for the city of Oakland, California, and is the director of the East Bay Clean Cities Coalition. He has over 25 years in the fleet industry managing private sector, federal, state, county, and city fleets. During his tenure, he has received national recognition from the, um, I think that's the American Public Works Association and Government Fleet Magazine and has been inducted into the Clean Cities and Public Fleet Manager Halls of Fame. Richard has served on many NAFA committee, chapter, and leadership positions over the years. He is currently serving on the NAFA's Board of Directors and Government Affairs Committee. Welcome, Richard, and thank you very much for being a part of this today. Thank you, Ken. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hey, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Also, I'd like to thank um, our sponsors, uh, the various Clean Cities Coalition, our host coalition, the Columbia Willamette uh, Clean Cities Coalition, and specifically the Green Transportation Summit and Expo for putting on this educational series. I know we're all busy, especially on Friday, so I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about electric vehicles and preparing your shop for their deployment. Uh, I'm currently with the City of Oakland. Um, we're pretty standard as far as municipalities go, specifically in California, where we're like many fleets around us. Um, if you're not familiar where Oakland is, there's the map and a, a little um, trivia piece. We are best known as the city who formerly hosted the Raiders and formerly hosted the Golden State Warriors. Next slide, please. Um, here's some of our recent fleet achievements. I need to point out that I'm not the fleet manager for the city of Oakland, um, although fleet is one of the divisions uh, under my purview. Joey Williams is the current fleet manager, and we're really proud of our operation and some of the recognition we've received over the years. Next slide, please. Uh, our fleet composition, again, it's pretty standard for a municipal fleet. We've got about 1,500 pieces of vehicle and equipment. Um, of note, we do not have transit, and we do not have curbside refuse, although we do have uh, dedicated illegal dumping refuse trucks. Next slide, please. 
This is our annual fuel consumption. Uh, as a municipality, we don't we tend not to travel long distances, so our fuel consumption uh, isn't huge. The fuels identified in blue are those coming from a renewable or low carbon source. And you can see significantly it's mostly um, renewable natural gas and renewable diesel. Uh, and we do have a electric and hydrogen component, which is rather small. It brings us pretty close to about 50% renewable or alternative fuel use here at the City of Oakland. Next slide, please. And this, this slide illustrates the change that was virtually overnight when we switched to renewable diesel. Um, prior to using renewable diesel, you could see by red that indicates our petroleum fuel consumption. So that was a, a tremendous event for us, and if renewable diesel is available in your area, you should definitely look into it. Next slide, please. Now, we're driven by um, internal policy and also specific city council direction to achieve petroleum reduction and minimize our carbon footprint. And how we've done that over the years is through a series of vehicle technologies and alternative fuels. Uh, we like to talk about Oakland. We've been the greenest fleet in the nation since 1998. And if you look at that center photo, you see the green Ford Escort that technically it is a green vehicle because of the paint. Um, lately, we've been migrating to green vehicles due to the fuel that's used. And we're currently using a combination of electricity, CNG, hydrogen, plug-in hybrid, and renewable diesel. Um, we don't think we're particularly different than most fleets in California and perhaps most fleets uh, in the nation. Uh, we tend to use the fuels that are available locally, so everybody's not on renewable diesel. Um, everyone's not using hydrogen, and, and frankly, we wouldn't be using hydrogen either had not uh, a third party uh, invested in a hydrogen station that's close proximity to our location. But um, regardless, we've got about 40 dedicated battery electric vehicles currently. Uh, Plug-in hybrids, our standard vehicle uh, at this point, our standard sedan is the Honda Clarity plug-in hybrid sedan. Um, prior to that, we were acquiring the Chevrolet Cruze diesel sedans and running those on renewable diesel, which we had to rethink that when Chevy discontinued um, the diesel in the Cruze platform. And before that, the CNG Civic was the standard city sedan until Honda discontinued the CNG Civic. So um, if you take away anything from this, it's don't buy the vehicles that the city of Oakland does uh, for sedan selection because the manufacturer will discontinue them and you're forced to make a choice. So we're, it just shows that um, our crew is flexible and this proves the point uh, that Clean Cities makes. There's no one fuel or no one solution that works for any fleet out there. So deploy the vehicles that are ne near you, um, the fuel that's near you and best suits the needs of your operation. Next slide, please. Um, we like to deploy zero emission vehicles where possible, but we understand that they don't always meet the needs of the customer. Um, currently, the zero emission vehicles that are available are powered by electricity or hydrogen. That doesn't mean that using other alternative fuels is not a good idea. It just means that that's our goal. Um, those of you that haven't dabbled in this area yet, um, this is the clear direction that the automotive industry is heading. Uh, just yesterday, there was an announcement from the state of California that all vehicles sold in California by 2035 are going to be zero emission. Um, that doesn't mean that it's, it's right or wrong or good or bad. That's just the, the way the direction is the industry is heading. So I, I would advise you to at least get some experience in this area. Um, and then going beyond the zero emission fuels, which are electricity and hydrogen, there's also some negative carbon intensity fuel. These are typically from uh, renewable fuel sources. You can see renewable RNG and renewable um, CNG also or both have negative carbon intensities. So we're, we're doing some exploration in that way, area as well. Next slide, please. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. This is going to introduce some animation. 
This chart shows the carbon intensities of various fuels. Where that red arrow is, that indicates the carbon intensity of petroleum, gasoline, and petroleum diesel. Down on right, the right-hand side is the petroleum intensity of renewable diesel. Next slide, please. And that circle indicates the carbon intensity of renewable CNG. So you can see these are really good options for fleets if you have them available in your area. And the next slide, please. This red ring you'll notice is under electricity and the various um, sources of fuel, electricity as a fuel source actually do reflect a carbon intensity and that's because there is uh, carbon emissions generated in the production of the electricity as a fuel. The notable exception is Trinity Public Utilities District, which is hydroelectric. Um, that is a true zero emission electric source. Uh, solar is also a true zero emission electricity source as a vehicle fuel. Next slide, please. So those are some of the reasons why we're uh, currently deploying electric vehicles. And as you know, uh, when you deploy vehicles that are fueled from different uh, fuel types, it requires training your technicians and in some instances, modifying your shop. So those of you that are considering deploying electric vehicles, you may have some questions. And the good news is if you're deploying hybrid vehicles already and working on them in your shop, you're already pretty much there. Uh, a battery electric vehicle, I like to describe it as a hybrid electric vehicle without the petroleum fuel engine, basically creating a larger hybrid battery electric drive system. And although there are some differences with battery, battery electric vehicles, such as um, single wheel motors, um, the principles are the same. So the support that you need to work on these vehicles is very similar. First off, you're going to want for your technicians, you'll want some class zero high voltage gloves. And you can see those in the picture. They're just like very well insulated gloves. They're nothing unusual. You can get them from multiple sources, including Granger. Um, one thing is to follow the safety standards. You need to check your certification dates because they have a window when they expire. And also there's a in basic inflation test that you perform, which is your technician can do it very simply by blowing into the glove. And this is just to detect any possible holes in the glove that could um, reduce the level of protection. Uh, we keep our specialty equipment um, in the parts room and issue it to the technicians. It's not necessary to have a set for each one of your guys or gals on the shop floor. Um, the next category is insulated hand tools. Uh, these are not a, a um, requirement, but they are nice to have. You'll find if you end up um, Disconnecting battery packs or working on the high voltage system. There's some standard size tools. It's probably a good idea to get these in the insulated versions just, just to ensure the highest level of protection for your shop staff. And also you definitely need a non-conductive electrocution pole in your shop. Um, that's the item depicted on the right there that looks kind of like a cane. And this is just in the unfortunate event of some sort of a electric incident. Um, folks responding are going to need non-conductive equipment to remove the individual from that situation. You also want to deploy some specific procedures for working on high voltage equipment such as hybrids and battery electric vehicle. And this includes removing um, jewelry, uh, disabling the battery pack, just standard operating procedures. And you may want to deploy some additional PPE. Um, batteries do have corrosive and uh, can have an exploding hazard, so it's important for staff to have corrosive resistant clothing as well as goggles. Next slide, please. As far as the shop tools and equipment, um, the first most important component, and you probably already know this, but you have to be able to charge the vehicles before they come into the shop and performing service. And that's for a couple of reasons. Some of the testing is going to require um, uh, checking the battery capacity and also you need to be able to move the vehicle around the shop. If, if the vehicle is immobile, it's very important to use wheel dollies because um, pushing the equipment can sometimes cause problems with the G regenerative equipment on the wheels. Uh, you definitely want to have factory service manuals available. 
in this day and age with all the new technologies, you can no longer approach a vehicle and figure it out based on stuff you've worked on in the past. You really need to provide your staff with the information essential to completing your um, job taskings. Uh, you definitely need a meter uh, of a range up to 1,000 volts. Uh, back in the old days, that wasn't very common, but since hybrids have been in service, I don't, I don't think this is an unusual piece of equipment. I mentioned the wheel dollies. It's also important to have non-conductive workspaces. As you remove some of the components, such as capacitors, uh, it's important that the workspace does not conduct electricity. Uh, I mentioned the insulated tools and the procedures, and I just wanted to touch briefly on EV warranties. Um, as you consider deploying electric vehicles in your fleet, um, understand the battery tech pack is covered by um, a very comprehensive warranty, eight years and 100,000 miles. And in California, some of the hybrids, the uh, ATPZFs, uh, advanced technology, um, partial zero emission vehicle, they actually have a state mandated 10-year, uh, 150,000 mile warranty. And I, I believe these are on some plug-in hybrids as well. Uh, next slide, please. So when you're talking about working on EVs in your shop, some things to remember. There's absolutely no substitute for training um, if you go in and, you, and you've got your staff working on the brakes or rotating tires, um, those items that are common to petroleum fuel vehicles, um, a lot of these things are very similar from platform to platform. But when you start getting into the drivetrain and you're working under the hood, uh, it's very important that your staff is aware of what they're working on. Uh, one of the areas or, or one of the um, components that's worked well for us is to include an aspect of OEM training when you go out to bid for an electric vehicle. Uh, we typically um, annotate that as a 40-hour training, uh, and then you can dictate how many instances and do you want it done locally. That's worked well for us. Uh, it was just brought to my attention today, and I, I think some of our speakers, one of our speakers will go into this down the road. There's also access on demand, which is very good online training. Um, always remember to charge the vehicle before bringing it into the shop. Uh, beware of orange cables. <clears throat> that's nothing new. I think um, any technician that's been working on hybrid vehicles over the last 10 years or so, um, they're well aware of this. Again, disconnect the battery pack before repair and always use wheel dollies to move the dead vehicles. You can cause damage um, that you don't even want to talk about. Um, and I will offer that it's better to install the electric vehicle charging equipment before you get the vehicles in your fleet. Some folks talk about this as a chicken and egg dilemma. It is not. Um, you can operate an electric vehicle charging station without an electric vehicle, but you cannot operate an electric vehicle without a charging station. So make sure that you've got the chargers available and working before you get the electric vehicles in inventory. Um, I also suggest that you have good, if not great, OEM support before you commit to buying battery electric vehicles. And this is uh, so you can rely on the local dealer to perform warranty prepar repairs and some of the more comprehensive repairs that may be required. Um, I don't want to scare you away by thinking we've had a lot of problems with battery electric vehicles because we have not. Um, typically, the battery electric vehicles that we've deployed they don't have as many repair and maintenance issues. Um, in fact, just by their nature, um, they tend not to be driven as much and as far as the petroleum fuel vehicles, but we're finding that's changing as time goes by and the drivers become more familiar with the equipment. But what we've seen is most of the battery electric work orders, they, they jump right out at you as a fleet manager because there's no um, parts or there's very few parts, there's no fluids, it's basically just a labor repair order until you um, start adding, if you charge out windshield washing fluid, which we don't, or you start changing wiper blades. When these things come in for a service, uh, we're rotating the tires, we're doing a safety check, and then turning the vehicle back into service. Um, as time goes on, we may have to start changing brakes, but we're also finding, as with hybrids, battery electric vehicle brake pads tend to last a really long time. So. The takeaway from this presentation is going to be um, don't let 
adapting your shop to support battery electric vehicles be a hurdle to deploying battery electric vehicles. If you're deploying hybrids, as most of you are out there already, you're already capable to support battery electric vehicles in your shop. You just need to make sure that you have the charging capabilities and that you have the factory service manuals um, to give your staff the resources they need. And always, again, I can't reinforce this enough, it's important to have a good local OEM support network before you choose a specific vehicle platform. Next slide, please. So with that, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, again, I don't consider myself an expert. There's many folks out there just like me. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to share some information that will hopefully um, help some of you avoid some of the pitfalls or hurdler, hurdles or stumbling blocks that we've encountered when deploying battery electric vehicles into the fleet. Hey, Richard, this is Ken. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear, Ken. Great. So uh, a couple questions, and I think they go together. It's from Dan. Are you ordering new vehicles with ADOS? Even though you didn't cover ADOS here, did, are you ordering new vehicles with uh, autonomous features? Yeah, yes, absolutely. We have uh, here at the city of Oakland, uh, when you're buying a standard vehicle from the OEMs, they have a level of ADOS already, um, whether it's one, two, three, or four. We are not currently deploying um, vehicles equipped with ADOS beyond the, the basic driver assist, collision avoidance, um, obstacle detection, lane departure. Um, we're not getting into the quote-unquote self-driving vehicles yet, but it's expected we will be there. Um, I think as a uh, municipal or utility fleet, uh, our bread and butter vehicles, the utility truck, the cargo van that goes out to um, provide support in the field or at remote locations, they are not really suitable for full ADOS. Um, once they're on the freeway going to and from, yes, and yes, they probably could utilize that technology, um, but it's not you know, as critical, I think, with the sedans. So we're thinking about it, and we are including the technology, but we're not specifically specking vehicles for like the level three or level four. To add on to that, uh, as you get into that area, the question has to do with training your service techs to calibrate these type of systems in-house. Are you thinking about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, our, our technicians are able to um, re remove and replace the sensors. I don't know that we've gotten down to the level of calibrating now. That, that's why it's important to have good OEM dealership support. As we get more vehicles in the fleet, as we become more familiar with the technology, we start absorbing these uh, as internal um, repair procedures, but we have the dealership that we can rely on at this point. Uh, what is the plan for servicing fuel cell vehicles? You have something infrastructure going together on that? Yeah, our, our currently plan, please don't laugh, is to take them to the Toyota dealer right down the street. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's a smart way to go. <laughs> Hydrogen's a, a really unknown quantity for us. Um, our staff can do, again, those generic uh, service activities, brakes, tire rotation, interior, the vehicle electric system. But when it comes to drivetrain on hydrogen, uh, we're basically going to leave that to the dealership. We, we only have four of the vehicles. Um, down the road, we may get there. Um, but right now, we're relying on the dealership network. The uh one question has to do with uh, fuel cell vehicles. Again, do you know of any training for hydrogen vehicles outside the OEM? This person just got a got three Marais, but Toyota maintains their training only for the Toyota tech. I do know that John Frala down in uh, Rio Hondo, LA area, has got a fuel cell training program there. What do you, What are you doing in the Bay Area? Uh, we haven't focused on fuel cell vehicle training yet. Uh, it's something that's it's on our radar screen. Um, again, because of the uh, proprietary um, knowledge that's required, and we only have four of the vehicles, that's where we're at now. Uh, we have the California Fuel Cell Partnership as a resource. 
And we think as these vehicles become more common, uh, there will be more offerings than John's down at Rio Honda. So uh, we'll probably be crossing that bridge in the next year or two. Uh, last question, where does renewable NG come from, natural gas come from? <clears throat> renewable natural gas comes from various sources. The majority of it right now is coming from landfill. So you have material composting that turns um, into natural gas, CH4 methane, that typically was um, vented in the atmosphere or flared. It's captured and turned into a fuel source. Other sources can be from sewage. Um, you can have digester plants that turn um, biomaterial directly into natural gas. And then we've also seen rendering plants um, which can be um, animal waste products, slaughterhouse, et cetera, that provide uh, natural gas that's from a renewable source. Those are the, the four main ones that I know of. Richard, that was our last question. I sure appreciate that. And uh, don't go away because we may have questions later. Let's go ahead and move into the next section here. Uh, I get to take this right here and you have to listen to me for at least 20 minutes but uh, I continue to be in the automotive industry. I've taught at Central Oregon Community College for 30 years and plan on being here for this year and maybe beyond as a part-time guy, but I work heavily in vehicle electrification systems. And that's what I wanna talk about now. I've got a video that I'm gonna share about my classroom. Next slide. Hi, I'm Ken Mays, the Director of Automotive Technology at Central Oregon Community College. We are now in our new Redmond Tech Center, and this is high advanced type areas. I'm going to show you our lab, and even though we have many advanced classes, today, this evening, I've got a hybrid two class, and I'll show you what's going on. So follow me. So in here we've got, uh, this is a lab with a hoist, but we also have multiple media in here. Students are working on a hybrid escape. And if you follow me over here, you'll see that we have a dyno that is part of our controller systems. And the dyno is used in one class that we'll have during the summer this year. And this is uh, pretty exciting to have all this great facility with great equipment. Let's go next door. We've got our hybrid class going next door. So as you come in here, you'll scan through the classroom, the lab area, and I'll show you just as we sweep from the right side to the left. Over on this direction, we have students that are charging a Prius battery and getting it ready for an energy test to see what the capacity of the battery is. That'll actually go in a live Prius, and uh, it, we expect it to turn out pretty well. As you continue further, we've got a uh, blue-colored Prius that had an air conditioning problem. We have a uh, silver Prius over here that came in as a lithium-ion plug-in in addition to hybrid, and the students are diagnosing that and finding out why that system is not working. Over here to this side, we've got a Honda Civic battery that we're restoring and getting it ready to install in another Honda product. We have students that are doing testing. We have course pack assignments. And this class goes on for about 20 evenings with pretty advanced areas that apply very much to our current industry and the future of our automotive industry. Right, thank you. Anybody can make comments on that video if you'd like. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is talk about some uh, equipment and processes and what do we do as we're training technicians to go into a vehicle electrification system. And this is real brief. Everything here is really brief. 
I wish I can give you 20 evenings to cover these things. Our first step in bringing in a vehicle is we go through a battery pack power limiting and energy capacity test on the car. It's a drive cycle and we analyze that and there are actually about 10 pages ago with this, but this is a top page and you can see that uh, you're using a scan tools capturing that data and you're seeing what a high and a low for the modules. In this case, we have 14 modules, 28 battery sticks and a Prius. Uh, the biggest thing I can say about anything I'm talking about is training is essential. You can buy equipment, you can play with it, but until you start understanding the systems and how it all works together, uh, you are just guessing. So let's go ahead to the next slide. I'm gonna show you just real briefly, in this process of battery testing, once we have taken the battery out of the vehicle, we actually make sure it is a somewhat charged battery. And then we do a power test. And then we do, uh, let's see another picture. I think the next slide has an additional picture on power test. I'm not gonna go through what power test is, but we're doing it per module, 14 tests, and we're capturing that data on a Excel spreadsheet. Then we go to an energy test and we bring that battery charge down to 12 volts per module. So originally it could have been 15 and a half per module. Now we're bringing it, making them all even at 12 volts. Next slide. So here are the results on there. And we see that uh, after the energy test is complete, um, we'll, we'll actually have some data that we would be able to observe and make a decision. Next slide. So here are the results of that, and you can see channel number two. Pretty quick to figure out that channel number two on the first energy test, we've got a uh, possible problem, but we'll make the decision to charge this battery again and go through power and energy test once again. Next slide. Okay, here's the results of that. Just one of the graphs that we get in, in addition to an Excel spreadsheet. The analysis on these take, take time training to go through this and understand what it's telling you. Go ahead, next slide. Of course, I can't get past this step until you talk about personal protection equipment. And Richard talked about this in the thousand volt uh, gloves and you have to have that. If you go to the site that I mentioned earlier, you can actually go to the standard for uh, safety equipment safety standards, and there are some exercises in there as well. You might wanna capture those if you even wanna use it for your own business. Next slide. So here we're actually getting ready to do a, um, uh, it's, it's called a power inverter and controls analysis test as we are looking at sine waves from an AC signal. And this is not only analyzing the um, the output from the stator rotor, but we're also looking at the inverter and the controls as well. So it requires a Pico scope. This one does. Uh, even though the probes here are the I-310s, we recommend the I-400S fluke. The I-400S fluke. So that's, uh, that's important that you, if you're gonna order something, those, those clamps are about $300 each. Next slide. So here we're looking at a good pattern from the Pico scope. You also get to learn how to filter out the signal. And uh, we have instructions on doing this. This is a good pattern right here. And let's go ahead to the next slide, Maddie, and we'll see that the next picture we consider a bad picture and the the uh, standard on this is that the IEEE 1415 standard says that the phases cannot be more than five percent difference and you're seeing that between each one of these you see the red green and blue there's some differences and that makes you pretty suspicious you want to find out what's going on and we'll go to the next step in the testing process Next slide. 
So two pieces of equipment, the one on the right, very popular right here is the 1587 Fluke. It's a Cat 3, does um, inverter test. It does, excuse me, it does a ISO fault test. It's really great, uh, great test, but we have found a better tool is the AT All Test Pro 33. There are versions of this out there in the market right now. Um, they are expensive, but boy, it'll save your bacon in lots of ways. So a personal story is we had a, a, a 400H uh, Lexus that came into our training facility, determined that the rear drive unit was defective. We went ahead and got a price on a used one. We couldn't find a new one at any good price. So we decided to go with the used one. We brought it in, had it shipped to us, and we tested it with the All Test Pro 33, and we found that it was a defective used uh, gearbox, electric machine. So we sent it back on another one, tested it again, and we were able to install that second unit. But that uh, time that we saved by having this instrument was tremendous. Next slide. This is a uh, chart from the All Test Pro and it gives you a lot of data and you have to get a little bit of training on this. It comes with some instructions, but you'll need some uh, additional training on doing this. It's very fast test. Students love it. You can do it in 10 minutes and uh, make some good decisions based on that. Next slide. That tester AT33 does the test for all of these, impedance, reactance, insulation, dissipation factor, resistance stator rotor deviation, contamination, resistance, and test value static. So there is no one instrument that I know of that can do that much testing. Next slide. This is a, uh, uh, we're replacing the um, MG2 out of this Prius right here. We determined that it was a bad stator and it was, I can't see the burn spot. You probably can't either, but it had a burn spot right there on the stators. Next slide. Another picture of the stator. A little darker in one area. You can see it near the top. Next slide. We're doing that, by the way, in the chassis. Here's a uh, General Motors transmission electric machine, and it's being tested with the All Test Pro. Next slide. So lastly, to conclude on that, there are some key things that you want to consider as you're adding in equipment for electric and hybrid vehicles. The uh, Fluke 1587, that's the insulation test meter, CAT3 rated, the All Test Pro 33, the Pico Scope with the high voltage amp clamps, that's the I400S, and possibly if you're gonna get into battery restoration and balancing, which we do in our classes, other uh, shops are taking on and buying that equipment, little bigger investment, but you've got to, in, when you're investing that, you've got to use it to make it pay off. So the uh, battery discharge unit and the charging unit, and especially the training to get you there. Okay, let's, uh, let's see if you have any questions here. Okay, don't have any in the question answer. Uh, let me go to the chat box here and see if they have anything. Um, there were some leftovers for Richard in here. So one question is a statement, just acquired a Gen 2 Prius with failed sales. We rebuilt in-house successfully for use on, as a loaner car. However, do you trust used cells to be able to cover with my three year 36K warranty? Always try to sell new Toyota cells. I am an a, in ACDC glove program, six, $90 a year, and they automatically send you new gloves before the old ones expire. I, I love the regular testing things. There are several ways of doing that. I think we pay um, for one pair of gloves to be tested is about $25 each time we do them every six months. I, I like the used um, uh, rebalancing the, the battery. We can, we've got it down to a pretty good art. I work with a, uh, a co-teacher who owns a company called Second Life Battery. 
he is up on it because he does it all day every day and we share that class together and students benefit from that. Uh, if you're going to get into this yourself, which I, I would strongly urge you to consider, if you're going to make a go of it, of doing more of that in your region, if you have adequate business in your area, go ahead and try to uh, look at that. But take a class. Take a class. Um, you can look at Future Tech Auto and join in in some of those classes. Uh, some of the online classes through Access On Demand, good opportunities right there. Uh, question, uh, can you get replacement modules for the Prius? And the answer is yes. You don't want to put a new battery in with an old battery pack. You want to have it balanced. And that's why uh, Second Life Battery is uh, expert at that. He sends most of his batteries all over the world in two at a time, just so wherever they're going, they, he has already matched what they need. So that's, um, that's an important thing to know. Don't put a new battery module inside of a used Prius or Honda or anything. Um, I had a question about one of uh, the Pico scope that we're using. Um, I, I uh, don't have the model with me because we have updated and I apologize for that, but I will get that during Scott's and, and uh, respond to that, that question. I'm all finished. Thank you, everybody. Oh, wait a minute. One more. Um, Steve is asking how, having just taken the L3A SE exam, how much time do you guys spend on electrical troubleshooting with wire diagrams? faulty circuits, et cetera. The test was primarily those type of questions. We go over a lot of that. And we actually have two hybrid electric cat classes now. We take in live work. We are taking customer problems. And believe me, we get a wide range of things. So we, we just don't focus on the uh, battery system. We focus on the whole system. And we're looking at the electrical troubleshooting pr process with wiring diagrams. And and the uh, Mitchell uh, does a pretty good job with that. And we're looking at all data and identifix as well. Okay, can I uh, pass this off to Scott? Hey, Scott. Hey, um, I wanna bring in my friend, Scott Brown. He's founder of Diagnostic Network. He's an ASE master certified automotive technician with over three and a half decades of professional service industry experience. He and his wife own Connie and Dick's Auto Service Center, et cetera, incorporated, sorry, located in Claremont, California, with a, which is celebrating their 60th anniversary in 2020. With a strong focus on engine performance and electronics, Scott began collaborating with other industry professionals online beginning in the early 90s. Since 1995, he has been an instrumental resource in the development of the largest community of automotive service professionals, the International Automotive Technicians Network, IATN, where he once served as company president. Additionally, he serves on the NASTF Board of Directors and is a member of the following associations, ASCCA, CAT, ETI, ICAR, and SAE. Scott is the founder of Diagnostic Network, which launched in 19, excuse me, 2018, given my decades away. And the um, website is real easy, diag.net. Welcome, Scott. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good. Excellent, excellent. All right, next slide. Let's get started. So we're gonna talk about uh, preparing your ADAS service environment. And uh, you know there is a lot to talk about, and we're not going to be able to get into all the the, the nuts and bolts here. But uh, you know, first thing I'd like to say is you know don't be afraid of this technology. And uh, what you learn today, or what you know today to be true, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be true tomorrow. Things are rapidly changing, uh, requirements are changing, so uh, you you want to stay tuned with uh, with what's happening. So a number of considerations uh, that you need to that you need to make. 
and um, and that's on space requirements. Uh, you know, if you've got a, a very small workspace uh, and it's uh, populated with you know above ground lifts and and that kind of stuff, you're probably going to be limited on what you can do um, and so on. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about lighting. Uh, that is an important thing, especially if you're engaged or will be engaged in doing static calibration for cameras. Um, and I'll, I'll have a couple of uh, demonstrations on that. We're going to be talking a little bit about equipment uh, at both the OEM and the uh, aftermarket. And then uh, we're going to talk about some other elements, uh, including training, which I'm glad to see that 75% of the folks were uh, really focused on, on training, because that's really, that's really where it's at. Uh, training and knowledge is, is essential. So next slide, please. So really, what's, what's required? Well, it's, it's uh, dependent on the cars that you service, uh, car line driven. Um, and in some cases, you may find that uh, for the vehicles that you service, you may already have most of the tools you need. And to get fully tooled up, you may need to just run down to the local ADAS supply center, um, AKA Lowe's or Home Depot, and, uh, and pick up some string and uh, maybe a level or two and, and, uh, and a laser uh, measurement device and, and you're up and running. Um, that coupled with your uh, scan tool, whether it's an aftermarket scan tool or an OEM scan tool, uh, you may be able to, uh, to start doing calibrations today. Um, but you're gonna wanna, you know, if, if you wanna really do some, some research on this, start looking at your car lines that you're servicing go into the service manual and start doing some keyword searching, search for lane camera calibration and look at what's required. Look at what, what they want you to do as far as lining up targets, um, what options they give you. Uh, in some cases, uh, if, if you're looking at a lot of domestic uh, car line uh, vehicles, uh, most of those are all dynamic. Uh, you're gonna go into the scan tool uh, you're going to prep the vehicle. Uh, it's going to ask you to make sure that you know the ride height is correct, uh, tire pressures are correct, um, and the vehicle's on a level surface. And then you're going to prep that vehicle by going into the scan tool and initiating a, uh, say, a radar static calibration. And then it's going to ask you to go drive the car, and the car is going to do a dynamic calibration. Same with the camera, uh, camera system. It may be just a matter of going in there and entering in and, and pulling up a, a dynamic calibration, and then you're going to be instructed to drive the car. And a lot of times the scan tool will give you a progress on, on how, uh, how it's achieving targets and, and where it's aiming uh, calibration cycle is. Um, you, want to, you want to use that service literature because there is a lot of really good information and it will and as we move forward, it will start to help you with the real world. And if you go to the next slide, I've got a document here that uh, was published earlier this year, March 26 of 2020 by Toyota. And uh, if you make a note of this number here, that tech tip um, T-TT-0603-20, uh, this will basically allow you to compensate for a non-level floor in your service center to achieve a millimeter wave radar sensor adjustment. Prior to this document, um, there was no way to, for you to actually successfully calibrate a, uh, a radar sensor um, unless you had a completely flat uh, floor. Uh, because on this type of vehicle, what you are required to have is a, a special trihedral uh, reflector and it sits on a, uh, on a pole and you have to put it at a specific distance and, and lined up with the center line of that vehicle and, and, go, into the via and go into the software and, and trigger a calibration. And the system is assuming that everything is sitting on a level plane. And uh, they have, you know, Toyota found that probably most of their service centers have slope floors and, and this just wasn't feasible. So um, here we go, we've got a, um, We've got to work around on this. Now, I'm not going to endorse this, but a lot of the, the work that you're doing is all geometry. And this, if you read through this, this could probably be adapted in other situations. So next slide, please. 
So on the lighting, this is another one that uh, gets overlooked a lot and uh, guys run into problems because when you're doing a static calibration, um, the problem is that you're, you're instructed what to do. You're setting up a target, you're going into the scan tool and you're hitting a button and you're waiting for something to happen. And if everything is perfect, you know, it'll tell you that uh, successful calibration is completed and you move on but you will run into conditions where it says unable to calibrate. And then what do you do? You have no visuals, you have no understanding as to what, what's going on. In some car, some vehicles, they might give you an error code that might give you some indication on what might be wrong. But in most cases, um, you know, you'll go back through, you'll measure twice, measure three times, find out that everything is perfect and it just simply won't calibrate. Well, at the very beginning in the service literature, it says, make sure your service environment is set up properly. And this is a screenshot out of the Toyota service information um, where they go over the importance of the lighting in the environment uh, for your workshop. Uh, because what is happening, and if we go to the next slide here, this is, um, this is an example of what's, what's happening. And this is why Toyota is, uh, as uh, spending time uh, telling folks that they, they've got to pay attention to the lighting. When the vehicle, when, when a machine vision um, instrument is um, operational, and sometimes when it's going into calibration mode, there are certain uh, operators or filters being applied um, to help with that machine vision. And so if we look at the two images here on the screen, the one in the, on the very left, the top left is your, the, the regular picture that we would see of a static target. And then below that would be the uh, operators applied, the, the filters applied to the machine uh, vision. And you see how it's seeing the, the lines and the circles. And then if we go to the right, you look at that, that lower left, you see how the circles now appear different. And if you took it, look at the top two top left uh, images, they both look similar, but the thing that changed there was just another bank of lights were turned on um, immediately behind the camera that was looking at this target. And it essentially blew out the top part of that target. And this is what can happen if you're in a work environment where the lighting is not correct and you're, you're hitting that button and it, it's thinking and thinking and then it says it can't calibrate. Um, I have had multiple people report to me and even folks at OEM level um, tell me that they've had problems with calibration. And sometimes it's driven by uh, the weather. Uh, they, they may have bay lights uh, in their service facility and on a bright sunny day, it may play havoc with them. So the looking at that, that service information will tell you typically that you just want to have the, have the light lightly cast straight down onto the target. You don't want to bank the light directly off of the target, uh, which can blow it out. So if we go to the next two slides, I think that'll show you a, a deeper look. So this is a properly lit uh, unit. And, and again, you don't get to see this, uh, this bit of information uh, when you're going into the calibration. And the next slide. And this is what happens when, when the improper lighting is applied. So. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about equipment. Um, we've got uh, OEM and we've got aftermarket. And so which ones do you pick? Um, well, it's dependent on, on what the service uh, literature requires. Um, you know, out of the gate when the car is produced, um, the OEM typically is the one that dictates what needs to be done to that vehicle. And I can tell you that looking at the early the early cars that, that are now in, in the marketplace, um, frankly, I believe the OEMs really weren't ready for the service end of it uh, because some of the requirements were ridiculous. Uh, Toyota to this day, they have, um, they basically instruct you to print out these targets and then basically glue them or tape them uh, to cardboard and then you're gonna put them up on a, up on a board and then you're, you're gonna mount them and, and and, and what have you, and that's what, that's what the OEM dictates. Well, the aftermarket, um, you know, and, and for as long as the aftermarket's been around, they have always looked at ways to make things better uh, and improved up upon 
um, processes that take place in, in the workplace um, and add a layer of efficiency. So in our shop here, in my shop, I, I am doing uh, training and instruction for a company and we'll talk about them in a minute. And they sell equipment. And when they sell equipment, uh, we, we provide training for them to get them, um, get them up to speed. And what we have found is that a lot of the, the processes that the aftermarket equipment have in place uh, just add uh, huge gains in proficiency um, due to the fact that the setup time is much quicker. Um, you're able to actually set the targets up uh, much faster. The target mounting is, is uh, much more refined. Um, and in some cases, um, and I'll go specifically on, a, on the Toyota, um, I don't know if there's anyone familiar here with Toyota, but Toyota has a, um, they, they call for a static calibration of the uh, forward facing camera using what's called a sequential recognition. And so they put a, a single target um, in three different locations at three different times. So you're, you're instructed to put it at the center and then you hit a button on the, the scan tool. And then you're instructed to move it to the left, you hit a button on the scan tool, and then you're instructed to move it to the right and hit a button on the scan tool. That takes a lot of time. You have to you know, set up your target uh, points. Um, the cars, the Toyota and Lexus automobiles, when they go down the assembly line, they actually get a calibration process that is done um, in what's called a one-time recognition. And if you look in Toyota TIS today, you will see some of the cars will offer a one-time recognition. It'll, it'll let you do either one. But the one-time recognition is, is uh, much quicker because you're just setting up the target once. Uh, the target is actually just set up right at the bumper, front bumper of the car. And it's, uh, it's pretty simple to set up. But if you're using the OEM equipment, it's dependent on which car you're actually working on. Um, the aftermarket, some of these aftermarket companies have figured out how to call up that process inside the vehicle because the software is actually resident inside the vehicle and they have figured out how to call up that process. So, so now if you're in the after, or if you're in the aftermarket and you're using that aftermarket piece of equipment, you can use that um, one-time recognition in lieu of the multi-point uh, recognition and, and save yourself some time. So. So that, that's one case of where the aftermarket can benefit. But there may be cases where you have to have an OEM tool. And one example of that would be um, uh, late model uh, Ford Motor Company vehicles um, that require a dynamic calibration of the forward facing radar. Um, you have to have an OEM's piece of equipment, but you also have to have a security credential to get into that uh, particular module. And in order to do that, you have to have, uh, if you're in the aftermarket, you have to have a NASDAQ uh, vehicle security professional credential. So um, this, the, the bar is being raised high and there's a lot to be aware of. Um, and I've, I've seen both things happen on, on, you know, we're dealing with software here. And I've seen software issues on these vehicles where um, even at the OEM level, you have a deficiency where it won't operate properly and I grab the aftermarket tool and I plug into the car and it works just fine. And I've seen the opposite, the, the inverse of that as well. So you're gonna need a mix of OEM and aftermarket and it will be dependent on, um, on the, the times and conditions and the car and the, the software and the hardware that's actually on the vehicle. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a challenge. And uh, you know the best thing for you to do is, is make sure that you have um, a network out there that you can feed off of uh, people that you can uh, reach out to for support uh, to help you understand challenges and how to get around those challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the, the training uh, opportunities uh, or the training options that, that are being offered through AES WAVE, I know that some of you um, on the call here uh, know who they are. Um, those guys are great. I've, I've known uh, George and uh, Carlos for probably about 30 years now, and um, they, they, do, they do great. Well, we've got a training center down here in Southern California, and um, we've, uh, we've trained a lot of uh, service professionals and, and got them up to speed, and, and, and we're, we're all learning all the time. 
if you reach out to these guys, uh, they can get all sorts of equipment for you, whether it's OEM or aftermarket. They have a lot of answers. I, I call them when I have a question um, because they have a, a good network of people that they're dealing with uh, to, to help us work through uh, problems. So next slide. So one of the things that I found in the training um, bit is that, uh, you know, I'm a visual learner and to get my head wrapped around how these things work, um, I've basically invested in um, obtaining some visual tools that help me see how these computers are actually seeing. And so what we're looking at here is a, um, a stereo camera system that is uh, similar to what, uh, say, that um, Subaru uses or uh, BMW or Mercedes uses on their stereo. And with the stereo camera, they're able to do uh, the, the, the parallels are given, right? They're, they're able to actually do measurements in 3D space. And um, this picture right here you see on the right, um, that is actually measuring the distance to that tail light on that car that's in the, the lane adjacent to me. Um, if I zoom into that picture, that 3D picture, that's actually painting a what's called a point cloud in real time um, to, to, so that these, these are how these systems are actually um, interpreting the world um, uh, around it. But more importantly, uh, the, the visuals, the seat time is, is really what's going to be important here. Um, you've got a lot of clientele that are driving these vehicles with this high level of sophistication and you as a service professional need to have a high level of awareness of how these systems operate and how they perform and more importantly how they're supposed to perform and what their limitations are because if you look at some of the marketing that's out there the consumer is being told that the cars can do certain things and and i've seen ads where the the they're showing the customer can take their hands off the wheel. Well, the, that is not really what's supposed to be happening. So having a high level of awareness on exactly how these systems operate and what their level of uh, delivery should be, um, should be high on your list. So next slide, please. Um, radar is another one. Um, it, it, again, when you're doing radar calibration, um, you're uh, on a static uh, calibration, you're required to stand up some sort of a target um, to reflect uh, radiation, uh, radio signals off of that, that unit and re return it back so it could figure out, you know, where, where it sits. Um, we have a, a development board here that we can actually do um, a visual. We can actually show live what that actually looks like and we can set move targets around we can demonstrate what it looks like if you have the, the um, radar module offset, uh, offset from the center line of the vehicle, and it, it expects a target at one, at one position. Um, and then we can demonstrate what signal strength is. Um, some of the space requirements, uh, say for Honda, Honda requires a pretty large uh, space. They may, they may require 30 to 40 feet of clean space out in front of that vehicle free of any metallic objects because they are looking for a low noise signature. And if you look at that waveform that's in the center of that, uh, that screenshot there, that, uh, that green line going across, that's the noise profile. So it's looking for what that low noise profile is um, before it does its sample of the target that you're going to put in front of that vehicle. So having some of these visuals helps the te service technician understand when they're tasked with putting out that, that target and performing that operation on, on what's being required and knowing what to look for if there is a problem that actually surfaces uh, during calibration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then some more stuff about what, what are these cameras actually looking at? Uh, the cameras are actually doing a lot of work. Um, they're looking, they're doing object detection, uh, and then they're classifying these objects. They're tracking the objects, trying to predict where they're going, um, and then they're feeding all of that data back into uh, modules to, to share, share that information. Now, you know, today for the cars that require some, some level of static calibration, um, you know, it, it, is a, it is a pretty steep task to actually set that stuff up and calibrate it. But moving forward, I predict we're going to see more and more cameras being applied to the vehicle and probably less 
static calibration being required uh, because these cameras will have uh, one, they'll have stereo vision or, or more than that. They'll have overlapping uh, perception uh, systems. So they'll be able to align themselves uh, based off of the overlapping edges. Um, and in fact, uh, for the for Tesla automobile, which has eight cameras on that uh, car, today the end user um, and, and or somebody in the aftermarket, if they put a windshield in that vehicle, they today can go into the menu, the customer access menu, and actually clear all of the calibration functions and then just start driving the car. And the car will actually go and relearn um, all the calibrations. So it's, it's pretty amazing on how uh, things are evolving and changing. And, um, but but the, the key is to stay up to date uh, with training and info. Uh, and so next slide. And so that's where I wanna do a little uh, shameless plug for a diagnostic network. This is a platform that uh, you can add to your daily feed or your weekly feed or, or whatever it is um, to stay up to date with what's happening in, in the world around you. Um, it, we can't all know it all. Um, and if you network with other fellow professionals um, and share your knowledge, um, it's gonna end up re, uh, returning dividends. Uh, I know that in my career, in the past 25 years with networking with other individuals, um, hanging out with smarter people than me um, has helped me become very successful. So I would encourage you to check out Diagnostic Network. And uh, next slide. And that's uh, Q and A. We have any questions? Thank, thank you for sharing that uh, diagnostic network. Uh, I use it every day as as well, Scott. Thank you very much. Great, um, thank you. Couple questions here, and the first one is: How does vehicle alignment and thrust angle affect static and dynamic ADOS calibration? Okay, that's a, uh, that is a great question because that is something that um, I dove pretty deep into recently. So early, early vehicle systems, um, you can see there's been a lot of uh, focus placed on, yes, that thrust line needs to be set at zero, and then you need to set your, your camera calibration. Um, you need to really reference the service information to determine whether or not a uh, whether or not one needs to be done or when it actually needs to be done. So for instance, early Toyota, say 2014 Toyota uh, Sequoia um, or Highlander, I'm sorry, 2014 Highlander. I actually had this in our shop. Um, wheel alignment. If you go into the wheel alignment operation, at the very end of the wheel alignment, it says if the car has a lane camera, uh, which is the forward facing camera, it says perform lane camera calibration. If you were just doing a wheel alignment like old school, because you've always done it that way, right? And, um, and didn't read that information and weren't aware of it, you would probably not do it. Now, the other thing that Toyota did is that if you say you did a keyword search and said, hey, does that lane camera need to be adjusted? If you uh, logged into Toyota or any service information system, and looked up lane camera operation, they would have a, no, a caution hint notice. And it says, um, if, the, if the toe in or wheel alignment is changed, perform camera aiming adjustment, okay? So we had this car that came into our shop and we looked all this up. This was in, in uh, July of this year. And we decided to call the, the dealer because we wanted to get a price. We wanted to figure out if we were in the ballpark or not on this, this operation. And the dealer told us um, that they didn't do camera adjustment after a wheel alignment, which I thought was interesting. And when I went into TIS, I found that the, the document for lane camera had been recently changed. Uh, the, the date was uh, the 20th of, of uh, July of this year. And they removed the word toe in and wheel alignment from that caution hint notice. If you go up to later model Toyotas, they no longer call for a camera adjustment after wheel alignment. So what I'm thinking here is, is happening is that the, um, in the early systems, the way the software and the hardware was designed, yeah, it was really dependent, uh, hard dependent on the, the thrust line and the alignment, but they're 
finding that now their software is so good that they can basically compensate or the thrust line does not have um, much impact, if any, on the calibration of, uh, of that camera. So I hope that answers your question. The uh, next question, I, I'm, it's a little, um, little uh, brief. And so I think he's saying is the autonomous equipment that you're using approved by OEM? So I think the question is, is the aftermarket equipment approved by the OEM? So, um, you know, I don't think the OEM actually approves any aftermarket equipment um, to, to, to certify any aftermarket equipment. So I, I can tell you that when you are doing a calibration, you're calling up the function within the, the vehicle. You're saying, hey, uh, module, I want you to go into this function and I want you to perform the calibration. Um, when it's asking for you to put the target up, say it's a, uh, a grid, a black and white grid, uh, six, six uh, blocks, and you're setting those blocks up per spec, and, and then say in a Nissan or a Mazda or a Toyota, you're printing up the PDF that actually has the squares and they're all to measurements and you're putting it all up. Um, they're not certifying the piece of paper that you printed it on. They're not certifying the printer that you printed it on. So um, this, that, that question is somewhat ambiguous and it is a big question. Um, you know, uh, you need to make a determination on what it is that you're doing. Um, you know, you're putting that vehicle back into service. We are doing field calibration work. We are not doing lab grade calibration. Um, and so, you know, you need to just look at what you are doing um, are you doing a proper service and putting that calibration back in? You want to start looking and analyzing data. There's a lot of data that you can uh, pull from the vehicle uh, to find out where the deviations are, the offsets before you touch the car. And then after you do your calibration, you want to go in and, and read those numbers. And in some case you, cases, you have adaptation. where You need to drive that car and actually start to look at that vehicle and how it's, how it's adapting. Next so, question. No, I didn't give you a direct, oh, oh, okay. direct answer, but that's it. <laughs> hey, the Go next ahead. question is from our friend Nelson Kelly up in uh, the Detroit area from the CAT Center. And he says, in general, do the foreign brands use static calibration and the domestics use dynamic calibration? That's what I have found. Uh, in most cases, the domestics require uh, little. I mean, it seems to me like they looked at what their service costs, their labor costs were going to be, and said, "Hey, we want to we want to minimize those costs as possible, as much as possible." Um, in some cases, uh, you know, I look at some of these pieces of hardware on the vehicle, and it may be the same manufacturer that builds that forward-facing camera, but the requirements when they went to buy that, that piece of equipment for that manufacturer were totally different. So service requirements um, may have been highly spec'd out at the, at the domestic side, but then on the import side, they may have been you know, led along the way and said, well, okay, now this is how we're gonna calibrate. Um, I have found though that some of the newer Mazdas um, now give you a choice. Either you can go through this laborious uh, process of setting up the static targets or you can do the static or the dynamic calibration, which is a no-brainer. You hit, you hit a dynamic cal, and then you just take it for a drive around the block, and then you're done. So um, I think that uh, the the OEMs are are looking more to go to cal uh, dynamic calibration. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next one is from Steve Ford, and Steve has been on our a lot of our webinars, I believe. I see that name. Uh, read along with this. This is in a number of your references to OEM equipped ADOS calibrations. You cited instances of system software parameters that seem to include recalibration during a basic drive cycle. Based on what you've seen in the direction of OEM drive-based calibrations, is it possible that there may be OEM advancements in automated calibrations that may eventually eliminate the need for aftermarket tools based on software and vehicle design object recognition advancements. Sure. So yeah, Steve, I, I recognize uh, Steve's name and, and Steve is a great colleague and uh, we, we chat quite a bit. So um, to answer your question, yeah, I, I, as these systems are maturing, 
Uh, and as the software is maturing and these, and they are, the OEMs are learning from these systems, um, they are continually adapting. Um, and again, in the service information, if you look up um, Mazda specifically, you can actually glean a lot of data on how their systems actually uh, work. Um, look for vanishing point, look for that keyword vanishing point, and they will talk about how it recalculates vanishing point um, based on load in the vehicle. So um, it starts to look at the vanishing point and that's where the, the two road line, the parallels would, would disappear into the distance. And if you had a load change or you're going up a hill, it would actually reacquire a, a vanishing point. So um, I think that when we start adding more cameras, we will have a point a position where um, it'll just be hitting a button and it puts it into a learn mode and you drive that vehicle around and it's going to tell you that uh, that car is uh, that car's going into calibration mode and and then when it's ready to go, it's it's done. So um, it it will be it will become very advanced. Um, in the future and, uh, and, and automatic. Scott, this has been a good presentation. I think everybody here would love to take your class. There's another last question. Here we go. Okay, we don't want to leave this last question. Um, Clinton Jones says, we use Easy ADOS from the Snap-on John Bean. Targets work fine, software and procedures from them problematic. Had to use my Honda. I, HDS and Honda service information in order to calibrate a 2016 Acura RDX. Fortunately, I have access to all of that. Easy ADOS used wrong wheel arc compensation measurements to base compensation off as well as use correct target distance measurement, but had it measured, had it measured from the wrong point on the car. Also, Snap-on software locked up on millimeter wave radar once corrected that and used HDS no problem and passed dynamic nicely and operated correctly on a test drive. So I'm finding a mix of OEM and aftermarket works. That's his comment. Yep, yeah, so there's, there's a lot there and yes, I've experienced all that. And uh, in fact, always question what you are doing. Um, because you, if you read in the book and I've seen this over and over again, I will see a uh, say a uh, an SAE measurement and then a metric measurement and they don't compute. Um, so if you're going off of one or the other, always cross check. Um, two, when when you're calling up these operations, again, this is software driven. And I've had cases where uh, an aftermarket tool would not call up the proper radar function um, as as it was taking a pathway, a short pathway from a, a checkout to the calibration, but if I went the, uh, the same way that the OEM has you go in and go into the service function within the module, then it would actually call it up right. And it was a timing issue. You would hit the button and it would wait and then it would execute. And in the, the short, shortened version, it was, you would push a button and it was trying to go right in and do it. And the timing was off and it would never calibrate. So. So these are the things that you're gonna, you know, we're, we're figuring out where the software doesn't always work. Um, in fact, one of the attendees here, um, he is, uh, he's a colleague and he had a shop, or he has a shop down here in Huntington Beach. And he had a case with a Mazda Miata that he had the two dealers and in a 28 day, day cycle and nobody could calibrate the rear uh, blind spot radar units. And um, they were working with uh, another local group, the AutoLogic guys down in Huntington Beach. And they asked if, if I had an aftermarket tool to do this Doppler radar um, requirement, because it's, it's kind of a sophisticated setup, the way that they've got it set up. And I said, yeah, I have it. I've never done it before, but let's, let's see what we can do. So they sent up the, uh, the car. I also asked to have them bring the OEM tool and software because I wanted to see what was going on. We went in with the OEM tool and tried to execute the operation and it kept saying it couldn't communicate with those modules. I went in with the aftermarket tool and it calibrated it right away. And I thought, I thought immediately that I did something wrong because it was too easy. Um, and we ended up recalibrating it like three times just to make sure. 
afterwards I went back into the OEM one and I tried to recalibrate it and it wouldn't work. So the reason it failed is because the OEM at that point in time had a problem with their software and that's why the dealer couldn't get it to calibrate as well. So again, this is a case where the aftermarket was able to uh, bring a solution forward and, and the, uh, the OEM uh, failed. So um, Scott, we've uh, Scott, yeah. good, good answers. And thank you. Ed. Um, one, uh, Viewer is saying, where is your class located for the uh, AES wave? So I'm in Southern California. I'm in Claremont, which is 35 miles east of Los Angeles. And uh, just reach out to the AES wave guys and uh, talk to them. And then our friend, Kurt Shadbolt, who's been on our, as a presenter for several times, he's saying one of the challenges with dynamic calibration are the driving conditions and necessary markings many OEMs are moving back to static due to difficulties associated with completing dynamic. Interesting. I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that shift, um, but uh, that, that tells me that there's still deficiencies. How, how is that car going to perform out on the road um, making differentiating between the lines and curbs and, and so on. So, um, Kurt, we'll have to chat some more about that uh, in the future. Scott, it was a terrific job. Thank you very much for being one of our presenters today. Uh, this was worthwhile. Hopefully other people will listen to the recording. You had a lot to add, a lot of great value. For all of you that are still here, I'd like to introduce Seminar 5. It is Industry and Education Partnerships, Building Workforce advocates for to drive education opportunities and funding. This is a passion of mine. I would love for all of you to come in, especially if you're from industry of any type or education of any type. We're going to be talking about funding opportunities. We can't cover it all, but we're going to have about six different speakers on this. And um, I think, Scott, you're going to come back and talk about uh, AES WAVE, maybe some specifics on that. And uh, I'll be introducing National Science Foundation small grants to colleges and industry together. Um, I'd like for all of you to come back in on the 23rd. So stay tuned. These are, uh, this will be our last seminar, we think, unless somebody says we want something else. But um, this will be October 23rd. Farewell, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.